Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, which is on-farm energy efficient opportunities. Um, today's webinar will be discussing opportunities that can help you make voluntary improvements to boost and save energy on your farm or ranch. I'm your host, Amanda McLean, the farm management specialist here at North Dakota Farmers Union. A few, few housekeeping tips before we get started. Everyone is on mute, but if at any time you have any questions or comments, we highly encourage you to type them into the chat box, which can be found at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. This webinar is being recorded, as you heard, and you can find it on the North Dakota YouTube channel, or we will be sending um, hopefully out through the email that you guys registered through. And then we will have time for Q&A to ask for each of our presenters um, after each of them permit, and then we will have general Q&A at the end of today's webinar. So with that, I would like to introduce our three guest speakers. First, we have Ryan Warner, who is the co-founder um, of LightSpring Solar um, in Bismarck, North Dakota. They are a commercial and residential company that provides solar panels and battery storing insulation, and they started in 2018. We also have Chris House, who is the division manager, sales manager, and project manager at Gateway Building Systems in Jamestown, North Dakota. He has been with Gateway since 2011 and has been in the grain bin field since 2009. We will also then have Grady Broth, who is the business and coordinator program specialist with North Dakota State Rural Development Office in Bismarck. Grady has been with Rural Development and has been running the energy programs since 2015. Um, so as you can see, we have a lot of experience on this call today. And so we thought we would turn it over first to Ryan to talk about um, what opportunities there are with solar panels and energy saving opportunities there is with that. So I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, thanks to the North Dakota Farmers Union for having us all and organizing this uh, event today. Excited to be here, and I want to get started. I got a lot to go through, and I uh, want to make sure I leave time for all the rest of the presenters today. But uh, I'm Ryan Warner with LightSpring Solar out of Bismarck, North Dakota. We're a solar development company, energy technology company here in North Dakota. We've been in existence, like Amanda said, since 2018. And in the last two years or so, things have really been taken off, and uh, I'm lucky enough to be presenting this today, but the rest of our guys are in the field still installing uh, one last project in Mandan, North Dakota. We'll see some pictures from that later in this presentation, um, and let's get started. <clears throat> the first thing I want to go through is just what we're installing, what the, what's the solar panel. This is the one we've been installing this uh, this fall in and summer. Um, every year, we usually take a look at the market to try to find the best technology, the best price point, and the best uh, panel that will serve our needs for that year, and then just install that panel. It's the it's the best, most streamlined way to, to, to bring value to our customers. And so this year, we went with Axitec panels. Um, they're bifacial panels uh, manufactured in Germany. So bifacial means that they capture sun on both sides, so you can get um, sun from the front and the back. And that's an ideal solar panel for ground mounts because then you can capture reflections off the ground. And so some folks will have uh, white rocks, uh, painted white cements, um, cover crops, other things that reflect well, and then you get an extra bonus gain you know, from that um, second surface. These panels have a 15 year manufactured warranty. And uh, basically that means that they warranty them about any uh, potential defects from the manufacturing process. And usually those defects show within the first year or two. So uh, if you're going to have a, a warranty claim from that standpoint, it's going to happen right away. The big uh, warranty is the 25 year performance warranty. So that warranties that you're going to have a performance metric of, of at least um, the first 25 years that they will guarantee. So if you have any degradation, that's beyond what they have in the warranty, you get a, a free panel um, for your trouble. And this, uh, we get lots of questions about how, how, how well do they stand up to the weather here in North Dakota. We obviously get lots of severe weather, thunderstorms in the winter, or sorry, thunderstorms in the summer, and lots of snow in the winter. 
Uh, for hail, they uh, are manufactured and engineered to withstand hail in one inch diameter, which means that uh, anything below one inch should be fine. We've had uh, reports of customers have um, softball-sized hail hit their panels, and, and they've been okay. So it does depend on the force of the of the, the weather system and the angle of the panels, and you know how that uh, actually hits. But the warranty is pretty good for for most uh, hail events you're going to face. And these pa panels we uh, retail at $275 per panel. That's for a 550 watt panel. Uh, every year that the panel wattage or capacity for each panel goes up, uh, you know, between 20 to 30 watts. And so this year we're at 550. Next year we're going to be inching towards 600 probably for the the typical panel. And that's just uh, as they get bigger and better. That's uh, that's how they're trending. Oops. I'm going to hit the next slide. Another question we get a lot about is uh, solar panel efficiency. So solar panels on the market today range anywhere from 19 to 30% efficient. It depends on the, the module and the manufacturer. Efficiency in this, uh, in this instance is a measure of um, how much potential energy is coming from the sun versus how much is captured by the solar panel. And uh, so as you know, the technology has increased, uh, is, is improved, the efficiency has increased usually by about 0.25 to 1% per year uh, for monocrystalline uh, panels. Bifacial panels, like we showed in the first slide, uh, and uh, the new, per, per, I don't even know how to say that, peroscovite uh, silicone tandem solar cells. Uh, these are the kind of the new experimental ones that are coming onto the market. They have uh, efficiencies towards 25 to 30%. And uh, what we expect is that as the technology improves, this capacity, or sorry, the efficiency factor is going to continue to increase. And so, you know, as we get to 20, 30, 20, 40, it's going to inch up past 30 and get close to 40 or 50%. The other important uh, metric to think about is the capacity factor. So that is uh, basically you have a, like at the, in the previous slide, we had a solar panel that had 550 watt capacity. So that's how much it can output when the sun is shining at its, at its highest part, uh, point during that day. However, there are points in the morning and in the afternoon when it's not going to hit that capacity or there'll be points during the night or during the winter when it won't hit it at all. And so capacity factor is the measure of how often your PV panel is producing at its capacity over a 24 hour, 365 day time scale. And so in North Dakota, we have capacity factors between about 15 to 22%. So that means your system is gonna be producing at its capacity about 15 to 22%. And that has um, you know, a, lot, a lot to do with uh, variables that we're not, we haven't discussed yet, which is the type of installation, whether it's ground mount or roof mount, uh, the azimuth, which is which uh, way it's pointed in the sky. Uh, towards the, due south is the most efficient, and then the angle and panel type. Uh, but as of now, we're looking at about 15 to 22 percent for that capacity factor for most installations in North Dakota. Well, the other question we get a lot is snow. What does snow do to panels? Um, I've got two installations here, uh, pictures that we did this fall. The one on the left is at United Tribes here in Bismarck. This is a ground mount. Uh, they're at a 30 degree angle, and this was taken on Tuesday. We installed this about two weeks ago. Uh, snow came on Thursday, so we're looking about four or five days after the snow had come. You'll notice that there is some still snow in the middle towards uh, the middle of the array where the panels come together in their por portrait um, layout. And uh, But this is typical of what we see of, of tilt mounts that are at 30 to 40 degree um, tilt, is that they shed snow rather quickly. And then when the sun comes back out, it melts pretty quick. Um, this installation actually is not uh, energized yet. We're still waiting to uh, to get some trenching done and to interconnect with the greenhouse that it's going to power. But uh, once it is energized, it will actually melt snow faster because the, the panels will warm up as they produce electricity. So if this was this system had been producing electricity, this uh, all would have been melted off. But this is kind of just sitting there waiting to be energized. The one on the right, however, is uh, one we did in Dickinson. And this one's interesting because you'll see it has solar panels, or maybe you can't see, but uh, underneath the snow there on top of the roof line, you'll see a row of solar panels that are pretty much covered with snow. And then on the uh, face of the wall, you'll see another row of solar panels. So this, this customer was concerned about snow and wanted to be able to produce electricity even when the snow is falling or in the middle of winter. So we had a kind of a custom solution where we put solar panels on the roof and on the wall. And even in the middle of, and this picture was taken in the middle of a snowstorm, even in the middle of a snowstorm, he was producing at his capacity for that row that's uh, against the, the wall there. So 
and the reason that is is that even though the sun obviously is not shining as much as it's going to when it's not snowing, he's getting reflections off the ground and the surrounding uh, environment that's enough to make up for what the, the sun's not providing. So as the light kind of gets diffused through snow, it still has some energy ca capacity within it. And he's able at this at this point to get all his um, capacity out of that uh, wall array. So, um, you know, they do work well within the snow uh, situation if you uh, install them correctly. Uh, Obviously, if snow is covering them, they're not going to produce as well. So that's why we like to get a high tilt angle or something that's on a wall. The other thing to think about when it comes to, to North Dakota's climate is that uh, heat creates resistance. So once you've, um, so like if you're in Arizona and it's 120 degrees outside or something, and uh, those panels are out there working and with all that heat from the uh, hot air, it creates resistance, which degrades the efficiency of those panels. So even though they have great sun, um, they're not getting the most efficient conversion of, of electricity because of the heat component. So in North Dakota, our cold climate actually um, creates an efficiency gain because we have less heat over time, which increases the system's lifespan because there's less thermal de degradation over time. So that's one of the, one of the good things about uh, North Dakota's climate and, and solar. The other thing we've been working on, especially this year, is agrivoltaics. So agrivoltaics is just uh, putting agriculture and photovoltaics or um, PV, solar PV together. So ways to kind of co-locate solar plus agricultural activities. And this is kind of an experimental field. Um, it's not uh, been out there for more than the last five years, but it's a very interesting idea to kind of maximize the land use, uh, the land potential of, of any um, agricultural operation. So. There are some benefits to agrivoltaics I wanted to go over real quick. Uh, you have kind of the environmental and agricultural improved conditions. You can have shade for plants or livestock. Uh, you get a cooling effect around the solar arrays. So if you have too much heat, sometimes it can be adverse to your crops. And then you can also use agriculture for, uh, sorry, the racking for agricultural needs, such as uh, supporting lines for hops or tomatoes. And then obviously there's the economic component. We're going to talk more about that here in a little bit, but um, you have basically another a stream of income, another hedge against uh, some of the other um, risks of farming. And you can uh, use your solar panels to lower your operating costs by decreasing your electrical consumption. You can sell back to the grid if you overproduce. And uh, it's a way to keep things local uh, here in North Dakota by producing your electricity and kind of being self-reliant. And then there obviously there's multi-uses. So you can... You can um, have bee pollinators um, underneath your solar panels and, uh, and help them keep them out of the sun. You can graze cattle or raise crops between solar rows. Uh, so again, you're just having the multi-use multi um, agricultural and solar um, photovoltaic production happening on your land at the same time. So it's just a way to maximize the economic output of your, of your resource. Now, I want to show you some pictures here so you get the idea. This is a project we're doing uh, for the USDA Research Center in Mandan. This is the one they're still working on. Uh, we got hit with snow in the middle of this. This was from about two weeks ago when it was nice out. You'll notice that um, these are kind of high clearance racks. So the idea was they wanted to be able to run their tractors uh, under and around the panels and be able to do uh, their uh, farming activities at the same time they had solar being produced in these uh, sections of their land. Now, the snow did come, and uh, as you'll see here, the idea is, and the, and the reason I've got this one out, is that you'll see the shading uh, part of, parts of the land. So what the, the research is going to do is they're going to kind of compare the parts of the crop land that has shading from the panels versus the part that didn't get shaded. And they're going to measure yield and, you know, quality of, of produce and stuff like that to see what, you know, basically to quantify the benefits of agrivoltaics. And uh, so it's a very exciting project. Uh, hopefully we're, uh, we're going to finish here in the next couple of weeks, weather permitting, and then they'll do their research and we'll get some numbers to see what it actually um, is able to uh, produce for, for farmers. I wanted to highlight um, other kind of on-farm solar uh, development opportunities. This is a um, basically a pole barn with, with solar on the, on the top um, facing south, you'll see. And this was actually a USDA REAP grant recipient uh, in rugby, North Dakota. Great, I won't steal great, Grady's thunder, but he's going to tell you all about that great program from the USTA. But these uh, the North Central Builders approached us. They basically wanted a way to you know, have another hedge against some other operating costs. 
And uh, we were able to find a good fit for their new building. And we've actually worked with some other uh, businesses in rugby based on word of mouth from this project, uh, as it was very successful for that, for North uh, Central Builders. And that kind of uh, is the segue into the, the big question on everyone's mind. What's the return on investments? Uh, how soon will I break even if I uh, decided to invest in solar? I think the first thing to think about, and I'm going to give you some general some general uh, topics to be able to think uh, to, uh, about your own situation and see if it makes sense for you. So the first thing to think about is self-generation is anti-inflationary. -infl it creates a fixed cost uh, where, where, where it once was variable. And uh, as we know, you know, inflation has hit pretty hard the last couple of years and fuel costs, energy costs are a huge driver of inflation. So you can think of solar as a way to kind of have a hedge against inflation, create this fixed cost where you um, could potentially have increasing costs over the next 20 to 25 years. And that's usually the lifespan of your solar asset is 20 to 25 years, uh, at least from the warranty standpoint. We've seen um, installations that have gone towards 40 and 50 years uh, here in North Dakota, again, due to our uh, nice cold climate. After the inflation uh, piece, the next thing to think about is your cost of electricity. So um, we're going to get into some bills here in a second, but the higher your KWH cost, the uh, the rate that you pay for each uh, electron that you use, uh, the higher that cost is, the faster your system will break even. So basically you're offsetting a cost. If the cost is high, then you're going to catch flow faster. Pretty simple. The second thing is to look at your bill because um, recently utilities have started to change the way that they bill customers to better reflect their costs. So um, it's not just about uh, how much electricity you use, it's when you use electricity and to what extent you use electricity when you do use it. So if your KWH cost is your biggest cost driver, uh, then solar is going to be a pretty good cash flow um, opportunity for you. If demand charges are your biggest cost driver, then solar PV may not cash flow very well. Now, demand charges are what the, the utility passes on to its customers for when you have a, a, a large amount of electricity consumption in real time. So, for example, if you're at your house and you're running your dryer and you're making a piece of toast and the oven's on and uh, you're running some electric heat all at the same time, you're going to have this huge demand for who knows, maybe a half hour to an hour. Uh, maybe let's say it's 15 kW that you're you're pulling at that one time from the utility. And that's a huge demand when at other times you might be having, you know, like 500 watts being consumed or something like that. So something much, much smaller. And so since the utility has to provide that demand, you know, uh, have that capacity on demand at all times, they're, they've decided to pass that charge on to customers because that better reflects how their costs. So as they get a better handle of what their costs are, they've been starting to, to pass that on to the customers. Um, so it's fair for everybody. The next thing, number four, look at when you use the most electricity. If your largest loads are in the summer, then it's a great match with solar PV because obviously the sun is going to produce more in the summertime. We all know that uh, as, uh, in an agricultural community. Um, if your largest loads are in the fall, for example, uh, when you're doing grain drying or in the winter when you have a, an electric heat load or some other heat uh, related load, then solar PV is, uh, will need to be oversized or paired with battery st storage to the cash flow. So basically sun doesn't shine as much in, in the fall or in the winter. And so to match that load, we would have to oversize something that would overproduce during the summer um, when it would have its best um, capacity. The third, uh, the number five, uh, you also need to understand your uh, utilities buyback policy. Here in North Dakota, we have kind of a patchwork of uh, regulations policies when it comes to uh, distributed energy resources. So each utility has a slightly different distributed energy policy. But in general, we can tell you a couple of things. Um, all investor-owned utilities offer net billing. So investor-owned utilities would be your MDUs, uh, your Otter Tail, your Excel Energy. And they all offer net billing due to state law. And so net billing allows customers to bank their excess energy. So if you produce a bunch of energy during the day, but you can't consume it all, you send it back to the grid and those utilities will credit credit you or track that extra production. And then at night when you consume it, they'll basically give you the credit back to your, to, to your bill. So this kind of allows customers to recoup the retail value of their electricity when it's exported to the grid. And obviously if you're recouping your retail value, then you're, you're going to cash flow much better and it'll be a better investment for you. Last but not least tax appetite. Uh, there's been lots of uh, great tax incentives from the federal government, but you need to have tax liability or tax appetites to be able to, um, 
you know, take advantage of that stuff. Now, with this recent law from 2022 called the uh, IRA law, the Inflation Reduction Act, they've allowed these tax incentives to be transferred or paid out directly. Now, those details are still being worked out, so I don't have too much to share with you. But even if you don't have too much tax appetite, there are ways to, to monetize uh, these credits in a way that will help your project cash flow. So let's get into some, um, some concrete examples. This is the first example. I, I want to direct your attention over to the upper right where you see this bill. Uh, and I've blacked out some of the identifying information, but I want to show you a couple things here because this is a really interesting bill. You'll notice, number one, this customer is using 14,600 kWh per month, or at least they did in this month, which is a huge amount of electricity. However, they're only being charged by their utility uh, about 3.318 cents per kilowatt hour. So even though they're using a bunch of electricity, they are not getting charged that much for it. So that's number one to think about. Number two, Look at these demand charges and they're um, listed as on peak demand. You'll notice that their demand for that uh, particular month was 65.6 kW. And so for each kW that they um, that comprises their demand, they're getting charged $21. So 65 times 21 becomes a huge number. And oops, we have their demand charge for that month at 1400. So it really dwarfs uh, what was their consumption charge with their demand charges. Now, if you go up to the top of this, the utility has been kind enough to show exactly where, oops, where that demand charge occurred. And it occurred in the morning time on, on uh, February 24th. So this is the winter, this is the morning. This is likely electric heat came on there may have been other farm activities happening at the same time. Maybe they were doing some um, machine maintenance or uh, some machine cleaning and they were running some other equipment and whatever happened, it was a huge spike in electricity at that particular time and it created the demand charge. Demand charges get reset every month. So this is was their peak for that particular month. But you'll notice that this utility also has a second demand type charge. It's called their grid capacity charge. The grid capacity is basically your rolling 12 month peak of demand of electricity. So again, the utility has to provide this capacity at all times. Even if you only use it once, it's gotta be there all the time. So they're trying to capture what that cost might be. And so for this utility, they've decided that's gonna be the grid capacity charge. And that's also a pretty healthy number. It's $400, very similar to the overall KWH uh, consumption charge. So for this particular uh, customer, his biggest charge is the demand charge. His greatest consumption of electricity occurs during the winter months. You can see over here during the summer, basically uh, a very small amount of electricity is being consumed. Then in the winter, oh my God, this is a huge amount of electricity. So he's probably got electric heat and he's probably doing most of his activity in that building in the winter time. And he's got this low, low, super low KWH cost. So put all those factors together. This person is not going to cash flow very well if they decide to go with solar. So you'll see over here, we've run the numbers. Break-even points about year 23 and a half to 24. And the internal rate of return, basically, you take, um, you know, for example, you've got some money invested in the stock market. And each year, they either go up or go down. If, they, if this person had invested their starting uh, costs in the stock market, they would have got an annual rate of return over the 30 years that the, this analysis comprises of 1.8%. So not great, similar to maybe a bond uh, CD in some cases, but not a, a super um, great investment. Now, let's move on to the second example. So again, let's start with the bill. And um, apologies for for this bill, because <laughs> this is the most confusing bill that we have in North Dakota uh, with this particular utility. And it's because of the way they've decided to break down the charges. They use um, several different riders to reflect their variable costs. So they buy coal fired power, they buy gas fired power, they buy renewable energy. And those prices are always shifting uh, as the market shifts. And so each month, these variable costs are reflected in the, the various riders. So you'll see they have the fuel and purchase power rider over here, which is five cents. And then they have a, a tiered rider, which is their base rate, oops, of um, either 
three or four cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, as you consume more and more, it goes down, uh, down and down. And then over here, they have some other riders, and these are kind of for, for transmission, for generation, for renewable energy. And basically, uh, this utility has decided to kind of break it down very granularly um, into all their various costs. But, um, you know, we did, we crunched all these numbers, and we figured out that this customer over here on this particular account, because there are two accounts showed on this bill, the account on the left has a kilowatt hour cha charge of 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Whereas this other account, which is a, a large general service, has a much smaller KWH charge, but they have demand charges. Um, so basically, the, the utility said, we'll give you a break on the KWH, but we're going to charge you the, the demand charge. And you'll see, again, the demand charge is pretty healthy over here at $600. But going back to the first account here, the small general service, they have this high cost. And it's rather breakdown. You can't see the, the monthly breakdown here, but it's, it's rather consistent over 12 months. So they've got a very consistent consumption. They've got a pretty high KWH um, charge. And so for this customer, we did that. We crunched the numbers. Oops, sorry about all the shifting on these slides. You'll, you'll see the cumulative cash flow here is going to break even between eight and the year eight and nine of the system's lifetime. So basically, by year eight, you've uh, broken even, and then after year eight, all the way to year thirty, um, you're you're cash flow positive, so you're you're making income throughout the the next twenty years or so. Now, again, going back to the idea of it, this is an investment opportunity, it's an investment instrument. What would be the internal rate of return? So, if you put this money in the stock market, what would you be getting back every year? The internal rate of return on this one is ten point six percent. So that's a pretty good. If you're investing in stocks, that's a pretty good return every year, and it's a return you can count on for the next thirty years. So again, going back to that uh, fixed cost idea. Now, I want to talk a little bit about incentives. I don't want to steal too much of uh, Grady's thunder, but we have lots of great federal incentives out there right now. There's a 30% federal tax credit on the, on your overall system costs. So your system costs $100,000, you get a $30,000 tax break, um, tax credit on your next tax return. The other thing that they do to incentivize solar is they allow you to use bonus depreciation. I'm not an accountant, but you can write off some of your costs for new um, investments in your business through depreciation. This allows you to write up up to 80% of that um, write up, write off within the first year. So if you want to take all of that depreciation, you can take 80% in the first year. So it allows you to recoup, you know, a huge amount of that depreciation value there in the first year. Typically, um, under other tax regimes, you had to do it equally over a five-year period. So this allows you to do a bunch in the first year. And then the REAP grant which uh, is available up to uh, uh, grant dollars up to 50% of the system costs. So uh, there are some caveats. There are some details that are important to remember. Grady will get into all that, but it's a great, great program to, to think about um, applying for uh, as you're kind of uh, analyzing your needs uh, at your farm. Now, we talked about the customer that had those huge, huge winter um, electricity costs. So when we have a customer like that, we'll tell them, hey, solar is going to be tough to cash flow. We're going to have to really overproduce in the in the summer so you can match your production um, for your, what your consumption in the winter looks like. So you can do that and overbuild and you might, you know, it might not cash flow very well. However, there are other opportunities out there. And those other opportunities would be solar thermal, which is a way to um, basically you reheat the air from the building using solar thermal panels. That's the middle slide here. And... Uh, it basically offsets what you'd have to consume in electricity to heat that building during the, when the sun's out. And then the other option is batteries. So we haven't talked too much about batteries. Batteries are uh, under the same incentive structure that solar and solar thermal are. So you have a 30% um, tax credit available. They're um, also uh, eligible for the REAP grant as well. Energy storage allows you to uh, potentially offset some of your demand charges. So we saw that bill where they had that huge amount of electricity. If you, uh, manage your loads successfully and deploy your batteries at the right time, you can you can much uh, very significantly lower your demand um, over time. So basically flatten the curve and have a very steady consumption and save yourself money that way as well. So those are two other options. Um, if you're still looking, you're still interested, but you do have this kind of high winter consumption. And I want to show you a couple examples of solar thermal. This is in Bismarck uh, at a shop and we installed five of these. And this guy was using um, basically overhead electric riser heat 
and some forced air heat as well to heat this huge shop. And he liked it pretty warm in there. I think he liked it like 75 to 77 or something. So he was looking for a way to offset his cost because this is a, you know, it's a pretty big cost during the winter to heat that shop. So we installed that system for him and he, and he was super excited. Um, this is a screenshot of what the, uh, the system controller is showing for output. And it was in February, 2022, negative two degrees outside, sunny day, one of those super cold days where it's sunny, but below zero. And he's, he produced at his capacity for those solar collectors during that um, uh, day. And you'll see here, it was negative two outside, but the solar collector was producing hot air at 142 degrees. So basically it's taking the air from a shop, which is maybe 70 to 72. It runs it through the solar collector, heats it up to 142 and shoots it back into the, into the building. And uh, they're really cool when they're working and they, they use almost no electricity, maybe five Watts to run the, the two fans. They're super efficient fans. And uh, they're just a great kind of low cost, super efficient way to heat um, outbuildings, machine sheds, quonsets, stuff like that. And that's where I'll stop. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to take some now. This is how you can get a hold of us. Um, we're Light Spring Solar again out of Bismarck, North Dakota. That's our phone number, 701-222-8887. And always email me, ryan at lightspring.io. Or you can go to our website. We've got all kinds of pictures. Um, to show all of the installations we've done and uh, to give you more information. And with that, I'll kick it over to you, Amanda. Thanks for the time. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I put Ryan's contact information in the chat box. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into chat. We'll also have time at the end um, if it for questions or if you guys want to email Ryan. Um, Ryan, so one of the, I guess, um, you guys is of service at Light Springs. You guys really do kind of come out, help with assessments, kind of go through that energy saving like you guys did. And then you also help with writing assistance for some of those different grant programs, right? Is that correct? Right. It really starts as, as an energy consultation. So we don't want to steer anyone wrong or oversell anything. So we'll come and assess what you're doing, what your building's doing, what your behavior looks like, what your bills look like. Then we'll give you some um, some suggestions. Um, sometimes it's solar. Sometimes it's uh, invest in um, better insulation. It all depends on you know the situation, and we want to be able to give the best advice to our customers. So yeah, it's very hands on. It's kind of a custom design service, and we have all kinds of different tools at our um, disposal to to problem solve um, to kind of make the best use of your investment dollars uh, and to put back into your building or your farm operation. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, well, I think we'll move on to um, Chris now. If uh, So with that, I will turn it over to Chris from Gateway, who will talk to us about some of the energy saving opportunities um, when it comes to drying your grain. Um, so Chris, I'll take let you start. Well, I can tell you that uh, my presentation is not going to be quite as informative as Ryan's because I've been all working on grain dryers for the last two months. Um, couple of different things to look at when you're talking about a grain dryer. You can see on the, the screen that I'm sharing, this is a grain dryer that would be from like 1970, 79 to 1985. Um, very inefficient. Back in those times, they were very, they were pretty efficient, but you know, for the time, but there's so many different, different other ways or different other models out there right now that have the ability to, um, be more efficient. Uh, one of the models would be a, uh, a tower dryer. So basically, so how a tower dryer works is the corn actually comes in from the top and the heat, the heater is actually down towards the bottom. So what it does is it puts heat, it sucks heat in from the, it, the air actually gets sucked across the across the hot corn that has already come down into the dryer and then it's recirculated back up through and goes and some of the heat exchanges, you know, heats up and blows out the screens. So therefore, when you have a, like a tower dryer, um, most of the people that I've sold tower dryers to, um, I've, they've always said that, uh, my one gentleman, he said that his, from his older dryer, it was about 25% more efficient. Well, 
25% is, you know, quite a bit. And he dries roughly around, roughly around 300,000 bushels of corn every year. Um, there's other different types. So like the newer, like all the brand new models, they all have different burners. The burners are more efficient. They, they burn a little bit clean. They burn quite a bit cleaner. Um, you can get the dryers to burn propane or natural gas. Um, they actually even make one that'll burn fuel oil. Um, but with, uh, <clears throat> with the, the, you know, then when you look at other, other models of dryers, some of the models have what's called high fire, low fire. So what that does is when the dryer, you set your, your plenum set point and the dryer will reach that point. And then what it does is it actually shifts down in like cuts, kills one of the solenoids to put le less gas pressure to it. Well, so then what eventually happens is the heat will actually drop and then it, so it cycles back and forth, kind of like a two stage heater that you'd have in your house to where like the models that, you know, that we sell, which would be the Matthews company dryers, they have what's called a modulating valve. So basically what that does is that basically when you set the, your plenum temp, say like at 200 degrees, um, it'll, it'll hold it right at 200. It'll bounce between like, you know, 201 and 199 and 200. It'll bounce right there, but you don't get that inrush of heat or inrush of gas. Um, the best way to describe that, it's kind of like driving, driving a car without, you know, without cruise control. Um, you're going to get better fuel, fuel economy if you run with the cruise control on instead of running with your foot. Um, I guess then, you know, with, with the newer dryers, you also get more efficient motors with them. Um, the energy side, you know, on the electrical savings is um, depending upon the size of the motors, uh, depending upon, you know, a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of variables in my part of the presentation. You know, weather is a big, you know, huge variable. Um, the moisture of the product you're trying to dry. Um, the voltage that you are, I mean, so as far as like more efficient, um, you know, anywhere like, you know, I've seen people, you know, I sold a, I sold a fan here two months ago to a gentleman and he was, he noticed that his, and he's only got one fan on his bin and he noticed that his electric bill seems to be a little bit lower. Um, you know, other variable of that is, did he run the, you know, my questions were, did he run the fan longer or did he run it less? Um, but there's other there's other things that we can do to help you save money on the farm as far as um, there's different in bin monitoring systems because like most people when they put product in the bin they throw it in there turn the fan on and walk away. Well, a lot of that air that you're putting back into that bin is non productive air. So there's different uh, temperature cables um, that we can put in the bins that will actually make the fans run when it's only productive air. So like if you're trying to uh, recondition soybeans, you know, most of the time we start combining soybeans, you know, in the morning they're 14% by the end of the day, you're 10%. So you uh, put your beans in the bin, you set your, where you kind of what you tell the computer what you want, and then it'll actually start and stop the fan on when the production or when the air is at the proper productive air. Um, so if you team that up with a with my understanding i when i talked to grady the other day if you team that up with a new fan as part of a package there's some potential savings through the reap grant um plus just even you know even just to save on your monthly electrical bill because you know some of these fans are you know 25 or you know 10 horsepower all the way up to 50 horsepower you know, you can really rack up some really good electrical electrical bills if you don't if you're running those fans nonstop. Um, so there's and then and then if you get the back to the dryers, um, there's you know one thing about a tower dryer as well is there's uh, less moving parts. Um, there's the energy side of it is it. it the energy side on a tower dryer is the the, the best. You can get uh, there's other different types of dryers. Um, let's see. So this would be considered a mixed flow dryer, 
or other people call them bird cage dryers. So with our company, what they have is they have, so most of the companies have like the little ducts that go in between and that's what vents out the air. For most of the companies, they're trying the triangles that they have, they're all one solid size. So by the time that you get in here where the heat section is out, you've already lost some air volume. To where ours, we taper ours down so the air volume actually will stay the same all the way out. So therefore, it's going to be more efficient than some of the other of the competitor dryers that are out. Um, you, you know, every, every, everybody's site is a little bit different. Um, so I, I guess um, when they talk about, you know, if you have questions about some of this stuff it's kind of a one-off or it's kind of a one-to-one -one process um your best bet is just to give me a call and i can sit down and we can basically what the sales process is is i come out to your farm and i evaluate what you have on the farm there you know i want to know how many acres of you know how many acres you have how many acres of corn you plan plant um what do you what do you run through your grain dryer and then if you don't have a dryer, then we kind of start from scratch. But if you already have a dryer, you know, then we really talk about the benefits of my dryer versus the dryer that you have. And, you know, I can sit down and I basically do up a plan for you to help you kind of understand and give you a couple different options on which dryer I personally think that you should go with. Um, and not all the time, it's not the most expensive one. <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, I, I look at it as I try to get the most fuel efficient one because that's, you know, everything with all the inputs of farming is just gone off the charts now. I want to make sure that, you know, I try to, anything that I sell you is something, anything that I would sell you is something that I personally would buy. And I like to save money and I know all my customers like to save money as well. Um, so we'll put together a plan for you and then um, give you an, give you a drawing for it and then then we can start the, you know, once you get that process started, then, you know, then I get you in contact with a couple different grant writers that some of my customers have used. Um, and then, or I can give you, you know, you can get in contact with Grady. Um, I've talked to Grady just a little bit. And from what I've talked to him, he's a very strong wealth of knowledge. Um, but then you have to, you know, in order to submit the the grant application, you have to have kind of pretty much a plan in place, you know, with all your motor sizes, what you're upgrading for power, you know, um, you know, just it pretty much the whole layout of the site. I've had, uh, I actually had, a, I've had since my, since I've been in gate, been with Gateway, I've had, I want to say I've had probably 25 people do did the different re grants or different grants and stuff um i actually had uh i had a gentleman do one this year and his project was quite quite large but he got a very nice large sum of money from the grant process that he got approved for so you know it's it does take a little bit of time for because i've seen the grant applications it does take a little bit of time but it's definitely 100 percent worth it just in the long run for this, the money that you can receive back and plus the potential savings that you'll have going forward. You know, like I said, I guess that's pretty much all that I got. I know it's a little bit shorter than Ryan's, but like I said, I've been, <laughs> been, been working on grain dryers, so I haven't had a whole lot of time to sit down and do much of anything. <laughs> No, oh, thank you, uh, Chris. And as I think, you know, like both you and Ryan alluded is um, you guys both offer and, and I think anywhere you go for this type of service is really one on one. Each operation is different. Sitting down, assessing. You guys will help walk through kind of some of those assessments where you can save energy, where you're drawing energy and then help either write the grants or tell them what kind of grants are out there or get them in connection with the right people. And so, um, you know, that's really what we wanted people to know on this. And then I really, you know, as both Chris and Ryan have talked about the REAP program, which if those of you who are not familiar with is called the Rural Energy for American Pro uh, for American program projects. And so we will turn it over to Grady, who is an expert on this and will talk about how the ins and outs of this program. So Grady, um, if you wanna take it over. Yeah, 
Can everyone see my screen there? Yep. Amanda? Okay. Well, I want to thank Amanda and the Farmers Union for the opportunity to speak today. I want to also thank Ryan and Chris for their time today, as well as your time for tuning in and just kind of learning uh, the program. I don't want to get in the weeds too much with it. I just want to kind of skim over the top just so you know the ins and outs of it and can do something about it if it does benefit you. And like Amanda said, um, you know, it's called the Rural Energy Fair America program. Uh, and the main purpose of it is to a reduce energy consumption, you know, make your energy operations more efficient um, or produce renewable energy from proven commercially available technologies such as solar panels, which is Ryan. Um, you know, the reduced part would come in with Chris and the uh, reduced grain dryers and such. Uh, who's, who's eligible for it? So it's, you know, ag producers, you know, anyone who uh, receives 51% or more of their gross income from ag active agricultural production, you know, whether it's crops, livestock, agriculture, uh, forestry operations, nurseries, dairies. Um, and then the other one is for-profit rural small businesses, you know, anyone who meets those small business standards in your rural areas. Right now, the only uh, ineligible rural areas is going to be uh, in parts of Bismarck, Mandan, Fargo, West Fargo, and Grand Forks. So the rest of the state's wide open on that one. Uh, what are some uh, popular technologies and projects that people do? Uh, on the energy efficiency side, it's lighting, you know, replacing that end to candlelights and lighting to LED. Uh, heating and cooling, you know, your HVAC units, your ventilation fans, uh, your automatic controls, your insulation um, in buildings. Um, another one we uh, often see a lot of currently are uh, refrigeration units in grocery stores and convenience stores. On the renewable energy side, you know, we see solar, wind, small hydroelectric, anaerobic digest, Biomass, geothermal, wave, ocean, power. Probably the most popular so far in the renewable side has been the solar and the geothermal. Uh, we do we do see a little bit of wind once in a while, but the rest of them have been pretty quiet in North Dakota. Uh, one thing I, I do got to comment on here, though, uh, when you're planning a project or whatnot, um, you know the the program is for your ag production and your for-profit small businesses. Um, I cannot help with, um, you know, residential properties. And the, uh, the program defines residential properties as, you know, any place where uh, traditional living activities are conducted, whether they're single or multifamily. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, so on the farm there, you know, if you want to put, um, make energy efficiency improvements, I can do it to your farming operations, but not your house. Uh, if you want to put up solar panels, uh, the solar panels have to be connected to your commercial operations and then the grid. Uh, they can't go back to your house. Just something to keep in mind there. Uh, some examples of some projects, popular projects we've done here in North Dakota. Like I said, freezer and cooler replacements in your grocery stores. Uh, you know, your building improvements such as lighting, HVAC insulation, whether it be charm or uh, farm shops or it be commercial businesses. And then there's the grain dryer replacements. Uh, that seems to be the most popular in North Dakota given our economy, but uh, very, very, uh, um, very energy saving improvements. Here are some examples of renewable energy systems, you know, geothermal, whether it's in your commercial buildings or it's your farm shops. Um, another one has been solar thermal, just like Ryan discussed here in this picture, um, you know, those uh, solar panels are on the south facing of a shop that it was heated. And that was on a cold winter day too, just like Ryan discussed. Uh, deadlines, application deadlines. Right now, uh, we're having quarterly competition. So what we do is we take all the applications we receive during a quarter. Uh, we score them and we fund as many applications as we can, start the highest one down to the lowest one until either we run out of uh, our state allocation we get from the national office or we run out of applications every quarter Every cycle and competition a little bit different depending on the number of uh, projects we get and the amount of allocation we get. Um, right now, you know, uh, if you're if you get your application in in a specific quarter, you don't get awarded in that quarter because we run out of money or whatnot. You will automatically compete in the next fiscal quarter until the end of the fiscal year. Then the fiscal year, if you're still on um, unfunded, what will happen is you'll be um, Encouraged to update your application and resubmit it for the next fiscal year funding cycles. Uh, but the caveat there is um, any cost incurred before a complete application is 
submitted and accepted by us isn't eligible. So you do definitely want to get your application in before you start incurring costs. Uh, once you do get your application submitted and accepted by us, you can start your project. You just don't know whether you get your uh, award or not until it goes through the cycles. Now, so that, that brings you up to a decision. Once you get your application in, you know, do you want to, you know, start your project and do your project and chance not getting funded through the grant program, or do you want to sit and wait and see if you get funded um, before you start your project? Because you can keep on resubmitting your application till you do get funded as long as you don't start your costs. Um, so on the renewable side, the minimum grant request uh, has to be a $10,000 project or 2,500, whatever the lower is. And the maximum grant request is a million dollars. On the energy efficiency side, uh, your minimum grant request would be 1,500 or a uh, project cost is $6,000 or a maximum grant request of $500,000. Currently, you can request money, uh, anything up to 50% of your total eligible project cost. So, you know, like on a grain dryer, um, if you, you could, that wouldn't cover the cost of buying the grain dryer, install the grain dryer, and then wiring, you know, taking your existing wires and wiring up the grain dryer. Um, on the renewable side, you know, if you wanted to do, say, solar panels, uh, it would co cover the cost of buying the solar panels, having someone install it, and then have an electrician hook it up. So just something to keep in mind there. Uh, the other side of the uh, program, you know, the grant side is one uh, side. The other side is the guaranteed loan funding. You know, if you're looking to uh, do a grain dryer project or any other project, I mean, this is just not restricted to grain dryers or solar panels. Um, but if you're getting financing through your uh, financial institution, and they want to put an enhancement on it, they can request a government guarantee on your behalf. Um, you know, what the benefit to you is possibly getting more, or possibly getting the loan all together, or possibly getting more favorable terms, whether it be lower interest rates or more uh, longer amortizations. Now, in this case, the minimum loan amount is $5,000 uh, for a total eligible project cost of 6,000, or maximum loan amount is 25 million. And under this, the loan no guarantee program, um, the maximum uh, loan amount would be 75%. You would still have to come up with the 25% uh, as equity into the project they could finance. Now, if you were to uh, choose to do the grant and the loan no guarantee, um, the lender would do the 75% of the cost. You would come up with 25%. And if you got a 50% loan guarantee on that, that then would be applied to the loan. So you would end up with a 25% loan. Uh, how do you get started? Um, contact me uh, in your state for application material and resources. I can walk through, you know, if you explain to me what you're doing, I can walk through what, what could be eligible, what couldn't be eligible. Uh, we accept applications throughout the year, any time of year, but they're only processed at specific times. Uh, only cost incurred after a complete application has been accepted by agency is accepted for reimbursement. And the applications compete for funding based on score throughout the fiscal year. So how do you get started on this project? The best way, you know, you get started on your project, decide what improvements you want to make, you know, get your contractor estimates, uh, decide who you're going to go with, you know, nail down all your costs and what you're going to do. And then depending on if you're getting an energy efficiency improvement project, like a grain dryer or an HVAC or an installation in your shop or whatever it may be, um, the next thing you'll need to do is get an energy audit. And what they'll do is they'll come out and say, um, you know, I need your energy billings for at least the most recent 12 months, or it can be up to a five-year average. Um, and then they'll calculate a baseline based on your historical usage and they'll calculate uh, estimated energy savings based on um, what improvements you're making. And then as long as there's energy savings, it depends on health both And then with the energy audit report and your contractor estimates, you can then put in an application pack. Now there's three different application pack depending on the size of your project. One for 80,000 or less, one for 80,000, 200,000, one for 200,000 or more. Uh, just depending on the size of your project. Obviously the larger your project, the more detail and documentation is needed in it. And then once you submit your application, you'll get reviewed for eligibility and, and completeness, which is usually done within about 10 days, 10 days you know, to two weeks. Um, and what if your application is deemed eligible and complete, uh, your application will basically sit there until the next competition base and it'll just go through the various cycles and we will be in contact with you. Um, if you're doing a renewable energy system project, energy audit will not be necessarily be needed, uh, but you will need an economic site assessment. That will be when a professional comes out and they'll determine, you know, this is what your um, 
what you'll be constructing and where and how you'll be doing it. And then they'll estimate approximately how much you know, solar energy that will be generated in the project and provide an economic assessment what it will have on your operations. Between that economic site assessment and the contractor quotes, you then can submit uh, an application packet, uh, depending on the size of your project. Um, that's about it. Uh, you know, uh, if you got any specific questions or anything, feel free to contact me or reach out to me anytime. Um, you know, we can walk through it. I can walk through it. Um, yeah, that's about all I got, Amanda. Thanks, Grady. Um, I guess a question for you is, what is the general timeline it takes to put together an application? That kind of depends on each project, um, and it kind of depends on you. Um, you know, obviously, you know, gathering those contractor quotes and determine who you're going to go with and nail down your cost takes some time. Plus, it's going to take some time to get your economic site assessment and energy audits, and then time to sit down and do the application packet. So, um, you know, it all kind of depends on the timing of everything there, um, how long it really takes. It's going to take, you know, it's not something you can do overnight or over a weekend. So that kind of answer is kind of vague, but it's kind of specific to every project. Well, um, again, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, we also put their contact information if you guys want to reach out to either Ryan, Chris, or Grady individually. Um, please feel do. You know, sometimes there are specific questions that um, can't be answered directly until you actually kind of start talking about your operation. So, uh, with that, I mean, I don't really see any questions coming in. So, with that, I'd really like to thank again, Chris. Ryan, Grady, you guys for taking the time to um, share your expertise on each of your projects and how both uh, solar and grain bins kind of tie in with REAP and the other options that you can use with the REAP program that weren't necessarily discussed today. Um, I'd also like to thank you guys who were able to join today to the webinar. Um, thank you for taking your time. Um, if you would like to review this or share it with others, um, we will be posting it up on our North Dakota YouTube channel. So just go to the YouTube and type in NDFU. And if you are interested in um, have, this is a series of webinars that we've done. We've done a few, but we're going to be starting another series of webinars come the winter months, January through March. Um, so we'll have different topics and different speakers that will really focus on different egg education. Those will be one hour webinars that will be free. Um, you can review them too. So they'll be the first and third Thursday of every month. And if you want to find more information out those when they are, um, who will be just check out our NDFU page. Um, there will be more information on that. So again, thank you everybody for joining us and hope you have a good day. Bye.